For the All-American Girls League, they were founded in 1943 by Philip Wrigley, the chewing gum magnet, who happened to own the Chicago Cubs, and it was his idea to come up and fund a women's league. One of the first places I went was the Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. The thing that really caught my eye was they had a small manila folder full of just random newspaper clippings. The earliest one in there was from 1875, and it talked about two women's teams called the Springfield Blondes and Brunettes, and the newspaper article touted them as the first professional baseball teams for women. And what I realized as I saw these clippings was, oh my goodness, women have been playing baseball long before the All-American Girls League started playing. So instead of just writing about the All-American Girls League, I ended up doing my master's thesis on women baseball players in general, for as early as I could find them up through the league. Dr. Deborah Shattuck began her fascination with professional women's baseball while working on her master's degree in college. A history buff and interested in women's roles during World War II, Deborah would settle on a thesis that looked at the All-American Girl League. What Deborah would discover not only surprised her, but also others who encouraged her to write a book. Well, the book is called Bloomer Girls, Women Baseball Pioneers. And it is a book that focuses on women who played baseball in the 19th century. So as early as the 1850s, we have a photo of a young woman in a long dress holding a bat and a ball. So we know that they were playing at least as early as the 1850s, right on up through till 1899. As I discovered, these were theatrical actresses. Some of them may have been kind of athletic. A couple of them had been on in the hippodromes and the circuses, but they were stage actresses. And a group of men got together and said, you know what, we, baseball's getting kind of popular now. Let's form two women's teams and we're gonna travel around the country and have them put on exhibition games against each other and, we'll, and the men will come to see them play. And indeed they did. What I discovered, which was also interesting, is that the 1879 team that was founded, they drew more fans in all but one of the major league cities where they played. They drew more fans than the men's team, the major league men's teams were drawing at the time. When we begin to get into the Bloomer Girl teams, however, in the 1880s and 1890s, many of these girls were superb athletes. Now the coaches couldn't always find 10, 9 or 10 or 12 really talented girls, but there would usually be a cadre of highly talented athletes and then some other gals who maybe weren't quite up to snuff, but they would travel all over the country, generally challenging men's teams to play. The schedule was grueling, traveling by rail car hundreds and even thousands of miles in a season. Oftentimes, they played six or seven days a week. In the beginning, when the female teams were being formed, they also had to deal with crooked managers and little pay. Many of these early barnstorming teams, the Blondes and Brunettes and other teams like them, the Black Stocking Nine was the name of one team, uh, they were often cheated by their managers. They were promised exorbitant amounts of money, like $5 a week, which would be tremendous pay at the time. But then they would discover, okay, you got to pay your own uniform, you got to pay for your lodging. Uh, oh, by the way, we're short this month, we can't pay you at all. Um, multiple articles about uh, the police grabbing their baggage because they couldn't pay their hotel bills or they couldn't pay their train fare. So just constant problems for the professional players of the 1870s and 80s. Their managers, many of them were just charlatans, out to make a quick buck get to the 1880s and 90s with these Bloomer Girl teams, those men truly wanted to field good entertainment and good quality baseball. And those players were paid well. Probably not as much as the male professional players were getting, but certainly a good living wage. And of course, Alta Weiss. I mean, here's a gal, she's the daughter of a doctor who's vacationing in Vermilion, Ohio, right on Lake Erie. and. Um, 
they they lose their pitcher, the Vermilion Independents lose their pitcher, and the father suggests to the local manager, hey, my daughter's a really good pitcher. She pitches in a game for them, wins the game, and immediately gets hired by the team and starts playing. 1907 season ends, her father buys a baseball team in Cleveland, renames it the Weiss All-Stars. For 1908, she and this team travel all over Ohio, Pennsylvania, and she ends up earning enough money to put herself through medical school. And she's the first female graduate of the Wooster Medical School. So, and that was in the early 1900s, and she made the money playing baseball. One of my favorite quotes is from a gal at Smith College, and she was at her college reunion 25 years later, and she's talking about, hey, you guys, you remember back in the 1880s when we formed our own baseball teams? And she was reminiscing about it. And she said, do you remember when one vicious batter drove a line drive directly into the belt line of her opponent? And had it not been for the rigid steel corset class born in those days, she would have been knocked out completely. So the 1880, they're wearing corsets and long dresses playing baseball at the women's colleges. There were a number of tobacco companies in the 1880s that actually published sets of women baseball players on baseball cards in their tobacco. The thing that I learned about these cards, though, as I read some newspaper articles about them, was that they weren't actually female baseball players. They were actresses that they hired to play female baseball players. And they paid them pretty well to pose for these pictures. But the pictures kind of became collector's items and actually were considered pornographic by some of the moral reformers and were um, confiscated when they were found. Even in South Dakota, we had our share of women's professional baseball teams. So the very earliest team that I have found in the Dakotas was in Blunt, South Dakota. In October of 1884, I found just one little blurb in a newspaper and it says, a female baseball club flourishes at Blunt, Dakota. October 1884. In 1915, there was a team formed of women in Gettysburg, South Dakota, and the Historical Society there has a very nice photograph of the team sitting out on the prairie in their uniforms. By the 1920s, many of these teams would begin to disappear. Gradually, over time, uh, female physical educators began encouraging girls to play these sports because at that time medical knowledge believed that if a girl uh, was did too vigorous of exercise she could actually harm her reproductive organs. So they steered girls out of these more vigorous sports and into these baseball light if you will. And then by the 1920s softball becomes an official sport through Dr. Deborah Shattuck's book, Bloomer Girls, Women Baseball Pioneers, today we can now all celebrate these female athletes that enjoyed what's known as the all-American sport.